You're tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT-LP 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault, and today is Tuesday, October 6, 2020. We're sharing local news and resources focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. My guests today are Michael Bish of the Yolo Food Bank and Natalie Nelson from Pence Gallery, and we'll get to those interviews in just a few minutes. Once again, important local COVID-19 updates. Last week, the state of California moved Yolo County into the red or substantial tier in the state's blueprint for a safer economy, and as a result, restrictions eased for some businesses. Effective Wednesday, September 30th, and for the duration that Yolo County is in the red tier, the following businesses were allowed to open at limited capacity while continuing to follow the state of California guidance, the county's face covering order, and strict social distancing protocols. Here's that list. Retail shops, shopping centers, including swap meets and indoor malls, personal care services such as tattoo parlors, piercing shops, electrolysis, and body waxing, Museums, zoos, and aquariums, places of worship, movie theaters and family entertainment centers, hotels and lodging with fitness centers, fitness centers and gyms open indoors, and restaurants open indoors. However, each of these businesses have limitations on the percentage of maximum occupancy allowed. For retail, for example, it's 50%. For indoor gyms, it's 10%. And places of worship, 25%. So there's a whole lot of figuring out to be done there on the part of all of these businesses that can now reopen. And as always, for specifics, please see the county's COVID-19 resources uh, spotlighted on the front page of yellowcounty.org. Org. A little bit more about this because it's important. Yolo County was initially placed in the state's purple or widespread tier on August 31st, but we've been doing a good job meeting the red tier's metrics for two consecutive weeks, allowing for this movement forward. The state's blueprint tracks two metrics. This is where it gets confusing. The seven-day daily case rate and the seven-day testing positivity rate. For the week ending September 21st, Yolo County's rate for daily cases was 4.7 and testing positivity was 4.2%. And here's where you can see the progress. For the week ending September 28th, daily cases was 3.1 and for testing positivity, 2.5%. So to move into that red tier, counties must meet a daily case rate of between 4 and 7% and positivity of between 5 and 8% for two consecutive weeks. And that is after having been in the purple tier for at least three weeks. So that's where we are now. And although we've moved into the red tier, there are some industries that still face restrictions. For example, wineries are still only allowed uh, to operate outdoors with modifications, and bars and breweries that only serve, al only serve alcohol are still closed. In addition, all our schools in the county must wait an additional 14 days after we've been placed in the red tier before being allowed to reopen for instruction uh, that's in-person or hybrid. And Yolo County Public Health said it will continue working with local school districts, as, districts and colleges on strategies and plans for reopening for in-person learning. And there's a whole progression there of what will get us to uh, the orange tier and, and how we'll meet those metrics. But uh, really, you continue to see the drop, uh, a daily case rate between 1% and, and 3.9% in orange and, and so on. And counties can also move backward into more restrictive tiers if their metrics worsen for two consecutive weeks. So it is going to be a dance an ongoing dance. Again, yellowcounty.org under the COVID-19 spotlight. Let's uh, take a moment for music and we will be back with our first interview then. All right, my first guest today is Michael Bish, Executive Director of the Yolo Food Bank, an organization with a mission to end hunger and malnutrition in Yolo County. Founded as a volunteer-run backyard gleaning program more than 50 years ago, prior to the pandemic, the food bank had been serving the nutrition needs of more than 45,000 Yolo County re uh, residents per month. We'll hear from Michael about how much that number has jumped in the last six months and much more. Thanks for joining us, Michael. It's good to be with you again, Autumn. 
Yeah, so I last interviewed you on April 14th, which seems like a lifetime ago, at least in pandemic terms. And at that time, um, you all were just stepping up mightily. The food bank was in full ramp up mode, trying to get food delivered out to as many people as possible. So uh, what, what was one of the biggest shifts you had to make during the pandemic? Uh, well, that's going to be a hard question to answer because there were there were so many. So if I need to boil it down to one, I would say the uh, the biggest shift was going to a a safer way of of distributing the food, mm-hmm. limiting the contact uh, between individuals, so that we ourselves weren't weren't spreading the virus. Yeah. Yeah. And you actually started deliveries to households of people who couldn't get to the the drop offs. And I I, that just had to be a phenomenal amount of work. That was a that was a huge lift. And fortunately, we had we had so many strong partners, the county, the city, including the city of Davis, all of the volunteers, uh, many companies uh, donated vehicles and drivers and provided uh, other forms of logistical support. It was it was really the community coming together as a uh, pandemic response. Mm-hmm. And in fact, uh, it's become something of a, of a case study in, in crisis response, the way the communities of Yolo County came together to, to meet the, the needs of every single resident mm-hmm. here in, in Yolo County. Uh, I just recently joined in a, a, a case study involving uh, Rob Davis uh, mm-hmm. that's being um, recorded or was recorded and um and it's it's pretty phenomenal what we've all done together yeah so i read a statistic earlier that uh prior to the pandemic the food bank was serving forty-five thousand yellow county residents per month uh, how much has that increased during this time we're now up to sixty thousand residents that wow are receiving food from us yeah Staggering. And you distribute food all over Yolo County. You know, I've, I've interviewed um, elected officials in both uh, Winters and West Sacramento, and they both talked about the impact of the Yolo Food Bank in their communities and, and just how deep and, and broad it was. Um, let's take a couple minutes and talk about food distribution here in Davis. What services have you continued and uh, what's new or, or coming down the pike? Well, we're up to 25 distributions each month in, in Davis. Uh, so we have three weekly distributions at uh, Sac City College, University Covenant Church, and Davis Community Church. And uh, we also have a weekly delivery to the pantry on campus, the student-run pantry there. And then we have uh, twice a month distributions at the Davis Migrant Center, Davis and Power YOLO on D Street. And then three monthly distributions at Mutual Housing, uh, Davisville Apartments, and Shasta Retirement Center. We also uh, provide the food for the uh, the respite center, and we're also going to be providing the food for the new uh, interfaith winter rotating shelter uh, that's now uh, morphing into uh, sheltering individuals in apartment units. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I forgot one, actually. So we're beginning next week, every Tuesday, we're going to be having a food distribution to 96 households over at Monica, at Margarita Montgomery Elementary School. Hmm. And that's above and beyond the, uh, the, the door-to-door delivery that, we, that we're still doing in Davis. So we're still delivering to 84 senior households uh, right to their doorstep. Wow. So um, let, let's pull out one of those as an example. Marguerite Montgomery, how, how does that work? If people want to, um, to get a food bank food uh, there, what do they need to do? Well, you, you stopped me on that one because I just heard about that from my staff. Uh, <laughs> okay, pick another one. <laughs> so uh, for, for most of the others, they're, they're uh, dried left distribution. So that's one of the things that we've done because of the pandemic is we've gone from walk-up distributions to right. drive left distributions. Uh, so you just drive your car at the, on the given date and time and, and get in line. And then the, uh, but we, we also take walk, walk-up just, uh, clients at those 
for folks that don't have cars. Okay. Do you have to show proof of residency, proof of income? What, what do you need to do if you, if you need help? No, there's, there's no, there's no proof of anything. Whoever is in need of sustenance is, is welcome to come to one of our distributions. And that's because, as we know, the mere fact of when you start screening uh, folks, that, that, uh, that discourages them from availing themselves of, of much-needed services. Mm -hmm. And so food, the food bank model uh, doesn't do that. That is awesome. Um, you, you piqued my interest earlier. You mentioned uh, the, the UC Davis uh, pantry for students, and I think you also said something about the Sac City uh, Davis campus. You know, people, people seem to have uh, an opinion of college students sometimes that they're, oh, you know, people are paying for them to go to school, and they're all good, and they don't need anything, when the reality is we have a, we have a staggering number of poor students um, in, in this community. So can you tell us a little bit more about your efforts to connect with the students? We are working very closely with various units uh, on campus, including ASUCD, to, to meet the food security needs of, of the, uh, the students on campus. And as you quite rightly point out, there are a lot of students that come from struggling families. So somehow, some way, they manage to uh, afford tuition, and um, they don't have much in the way of, of leftover resources to, to meet that student's needs, whether it's uh, their nutritional needs or their, their needs for shelter. And we're just super pleased that we can help on the, on the food end of things. I'm sure it's... And the last... Go ahead. And, uh, it's, it's my understanding that uh, about 40% of the student body has some kind of unmet nutritional need. Yeah. That's a staggering number. Yeah, I remember my senior year at UC Davis, student loans had run out, and I lived on ramen, peanut butter, and bananas. I don't eat ramen to this day because <laughs> it was such a thing back then. So um, I'm, I'm sure you are helping a lot of students there. And, you know, I'm thinking about at-risk populations. Um, the, the whole uh, county has really come together to support the Project Room Key project. So can you tell us about uh, Yolo Food Bank's role in that and then a little bit more about what the interfaith uh, rotating winter shelter is morphing into and how you'll be involved? Yeah, so I want to say it was maybe the third week of March, uh, the county and the, the city homeless coordinators called us at, at Yolo Food Bank and said, hey, we have uh, upwards of 40 homeless individuals uh, sheltering in place in motel rooms, but we don't have any way to feed them. Can you help us out? Yeah. And uh, two hours later, we had put together meal kits for those 40 individuals. Uh, it was on a Friday, and so we had put together enough meal kits for that Friday, the Saturday, and the Sunday. And off they went, and we've been doing it every day of the week uh, since. It grew close to, I want to say, 298 individuals at one point. And, um, yeah, it's been this huge coordinated effort yeah. to, to meet the needs of homeless individuals so that they can shelter from the, from the pandemic. Right. And the, the interfaith rotating shelter, it's, you know, at, at my church, which is the Unitarian uh, Church in, in Davis, uh, I've cooked for, you know, I've participated by cooking at that shelter for years, which by its very name, it rotates from church to church. And obviously, that's not going to happen in the pandemic. So, um, you know, how are you aware that, that that's changing? You mentioned something about apartments. And then what will the food bank's role be there? It, it'll be uh, the same as it's been uh, for Hotel uh, Project Room Key, where we're providing the, the meal kits for those for those folks, it's my understanding that there's about 40 of them uh, that are going to be sheltering in apartment units in Davis, and so we will be providing the all the all the meals that they are the, the meal kits that they're going to need um, to be able to sh uh, successfully shelter in place. All right, as the person who's been steering the ship, what I've heard from you. Uh, repeatedly in this short interview is gratitude for people who have helped you, people who have stepped up. Who would you like to thank? I would like to thank, for starters, the uh, what is it now? The 181 volunteers that 
that make the food that make all these distributions work. I mean, these are 181 residents of Davis who are ensuring that we're not only feeding people in Davis, but but countywide. It's it's just amazing uh, how so many Davis residents are willing to help out. And then also the the food donors. Uh, if it weren't for the food donors, there wouldn't be anything for us to distribute. And mm-hmm. so we have these amazing food donors from all around the county, whether they're farmers, they're grocery store operators, food distributors, and the like. And last but not least, our, our amazing fund donors. Uh, 97% of our budget is funded by private philanthropy in a typical year. And um, it's just astonishing how, um, how generous and compassionate so many individuals are with their, their time, their funds, and their, and their food donations. Nice. All right. Um, just as nonprofits, especially the food bank, helps so many others, you know, we have needs of our own, too. I want to encourage people to uh, bookmark your, your website, yellowfoodbank.org. Um, of course, you need donations. Of course, you provide information. And I also want to ask, what are your current or ongoing volunteer needs? In other words, if someone wanted to get involved, they'd go to the website and what might be available for them? We have needs for folks to sort food, for, to pack food, to deliver food, to, um, to hand out food at our distribution. We, we have a multitude of volunteer needs, and they are listed on our website, which is at yolofoodbank.org. Great. Anything else you'd like us to know, Michael? I want to see the community continue to rally around each other because this pandemic is going to be for with us for a while to come, unfortunately. So we must remain vigilant and resolute. All right. Well, I want to thank you for your time. I know you're a really busy person. And uh, just, you know, thanks for all you've done for our community. And you and your, your staff and your board, you're really... Uh, it's Yeoman's work out there. You've stepped up. Thank you. Thank you, Autumn, and we really appreciate the work that you do as well. All right. You take good care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, once again, that was Michael Bish, Executive Director of the YOLO Food Bank, and an organization that has just continued to um, honestly amaze and astound me with their impact, their generosity, and their reach over the course of the pandemic. And uh, once again, yolofoodbank.org to support, to get involved, etc. We're going to go to music for a couple of minutes, and I'll be back with my second guest. And my next guest is Natalie Nelson, Executive Director of Pence Gallery in Davis. In pre-pandemic times, the Pence was a destination gallery in downtown Davis and a perpetual hotspot on the second Friday Art Abouts. Natalie joins us now to talk about how they're keeping art alive downtown. Welcome to you, my friend. Thank you. It's great to hear your voice, Adam. Thanks for inviting me. Likewise. So as as you and I both know, the arts and culture segment uh, has really taken hard hits during COVID. Um, so let's start with what do you do when what you do is offer an art experience and you have to close your doors? And you, the Pence has actually closed and reopened more than once as, as health times. orders have changed, right? Right. Well, and it's funny you mentioned March 13th because that was the first event we had to cancel, and that was the second Friday Art About reception where right. we normally get 300 people. And little did we know that we would stay shut for three and a half months. <laughs> um, and then we opened for just appointments only in June, and then we finally opened and then had to close again because of the governor's mandate. So it's been challenging, but like a lot of places, we decided to go virtual through mm-hmm. video. And that's been a wonderful way to reach people. We, frankly, had no idea of the impact of video. Right. So Um, you started a YouTube channel, correct? Right. Exactly. We had one, and it only had two small videos on it. And we actually created 26 different videos um, from March onwards that are tours of artist studios. They are um, craft ideas for kids. And then we did a lot of virtual tours of our shows. It was really, really fun, and I think it was a way to really help highlight artists and what they do and make people feel in their homes like they weren't so stuck. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, so it, that was one thing we really wanted to emphasize. It's been an interesting thing here at Davis Media Access during this pandemic to watch everyone else, you know, use video tools to <laughs> to reach the masses. And, um, right. and, you know, we've ended up uh, helping a lot of people with that. But it, it, it is it's everyone has had to do that, that that pivot in whatever way. Um, I want to talk and, about your. And it was a little awkward for us because you folks, you do it all the time. But <laughs> we had to start from scratch and we even put together a blooper. Um, one, because we had so many times where we just messed up. Yeah. Um, but it it ultimately ended up, I think, getting us a new audience. Yeah. Um, and we just did a virtual art auction, which was very successful. So we want to try to keep reaching people through the virtual means. Yeah. I'm glad to hear your auction uh, was successful. That's great. Yeah. I, I want to talk about your current exhibit that opened October 2nd, because I, I'm a little bit in love with the artist. Uh, she's of some renown, Sarah Post. So. Yes, um, Sarah's show is called This Is Not a Dream, and she came up with the title because she was thinking, obviously, about since March onwards. Sometimes we woke up and, and <laughs> we thought life was normal, and then for various reasons we were hit with these waves of, oh my God, I can't go out, uh, right. I can't see my friends, what's going on in the world? Um, and so the paintings are about, some of them confinement, some of them about counting the days, and, and missing our friends, really, and missing connection to others. Um, it's a powerful show. I, I'm i just so excited to have it here. Yeah. So um, let's pause for a second. Talk about uh, the, the Pence's location, so your address downtown, and your current hours. And what is walk-in access like these days, and what will people find there? Sure. That's a great question. Um, we are located at 212D Street, so we're right right in downtown Davis, and right now our hours are um, every day except for Monday from 11.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. We're a free gallery. We've always been free. You're welcome to donate, of course, because we're a nonprofit, Mm -hmm. Um, but you will find masks at the door if you need one. You'll find hand sanitizer. We sanitize all the time, and you will find a very quiet kind of contemplative space. Um, We've had about 20 people through a day, which is not very many people for us typically Mm -hmm. um so we do ask that people social distance and wear a mask um but it's been really nice to see people come back through and say wow i didn't know you were open it's so nice to be in a gallery again yeah Yeah. I think there's widespread hesitancy because we don't know. It's part of the reason I keep inviting people on this show. So are you actually open? How can people access you? Um, We we just don't know, you know, that feeling of being being stuck at home and being isolated. It's it's uh, I think it's challenging to kind of regroup and move back into those kind of uh, interactions that uh, speaking for myself, I, I really took for granted prior to this time. Right. Absolutely. And I think people need to feel comfortable and they need to feel like businesses are doing what they can to safeguard their health. Um, And so, you know, you'll see all of us wearing masks. Mm -hmm. We actually started a program kind of outside just to make people a little bit more comfortable where the artist is in the gallery, but everything is open to the air and we have um, drinks outside. And so we tried it out and it was a lot of fun. Nice. People social distance outside with masks. And um, we have one coming up this Sunday from 2 to 5 with artist Chris Daubert. Um, So we're trying to make people feel a little bit more comfortable. Yeah. Well, you have that beautiful courtyard, too, with the murals and the statue and and everything. So it's a really soothing environment. I'm uh, I'm making a mental note to take a break from my computer and my home office one of these days and and, uh, come visit. Yeah. Come downtown. Yeah. I want to encourage people to support our artists and our art organizations because... It's not just the Pence, it's the Art Center, it's IHOUSE, all these places that are really feeling this impact. And, you know, the arts connect us all, so we we need them. They do connect us all. They also provide us with uh, respite and, you know, sometimes humor, sometimes contemplation, all of that. Well, we've seen wonderful examples of voice through the arts, of people, you know, stating what they really feel. And I think that's one thing people forget is arts are language. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, after uh, Sarah Post exhibit, what's coming up next? Um, we have this fantastic installation show that's all carved out of firewood, so hmm. discarded pine by Chris Dalbert, who's 
you know, really world renowned for his sculpture and his installation. And so he is going to be um, opening it. Actually, it's supposed to open today. Um, and so you walk in and it looks like an empty gallery and these sculptures are floating behind a screen. Hmm. And, but they're real. And so that continues through November 29th. Um, and they're, they're lit in this really mysterious way. So you have to come in to see it. We're going to do a video, but it just won't capture what it feels like to be in the space with these kind of mystical objects. All right. Um, and, and then the next month we have Holiday Market, which I believe opens um, November 6th. So we're going to try some holiday shopping, see if people feel comfortable coming in. We hope so. And support the gallery as well as our artists. All we right. Just, we just keep going. All right. Well, we thank you to. so much thank for joining us. Long. And, uh, and thanks for sharing what the Pence is up to. And I want to make sure I have this right, pencegallery.org for all the info. Absolutely. All right. Thanks yep. so much, Natalie. Thank you so much, Autumn. <laughs> all right. Take good okay. care. You too. Bye-bye. All right. That was Natalie Nelson with Pence Gallery. Good to hear that they are open and uh, continuing to stage interesting exhibits downtown, pencegallery.org, for more info. Uh, next week, I've got my show partially organized. Uh, Heather Sluter of the Yolo Crisis Nursery will talk to us about how parenting has gotten even harder during the pandemic. It's a really important conversation. You parents out there, especially of young kids with home, hang in there. You are loved and you are seen. All right, this is Autumn Labbe Renault, live from the KDRT studio. With